Great. Well, welcome everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, good morning. My name is Jennifer Lee, and I am from the city of Burlingame and will be moderating today's program. Along with our co-sponsor, Bosca, and our instructor, I want to welcome all of you. Before we begin, I'm going to go over some housekeeping. Next slide. First, all attendees are muted by default to reduce the background noise of the presentation. And we will be pausing periodically throughout the presentation to allow for questions. And we highly encourage you to ask any questions that you have. And you can do so by either using the raise hand feature or you can use the Q&A function and our moderator, which is me, will read the questions for the instructor. And if we don't get to your questions, we will have Q&A at the very end. Um, so feel free to just keep asking questions. And I also would like to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Bosca's website. So first I'd like to uh, introduce what Bosca or the Bay Area Water Supply Conservation Agency is. Um, Bosca is a special district that represents 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all of which purchase water from the San Francisco Regional Water System. Bosca's member agencies collectively serve over 1.8 million residents, 40,000 businesses, all within San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties. And Bosco's goal is high quality supply of water at a fair price. And consistent with that goal, Bosca offers a landscape education program to support agencies and the residents in improving water use efficiency. And while we have made significant strides in water use efficiency, there's still room for improvement and outdoor water use provides the biggest potential source of untapped savings. Um, and we, yeah, go ahead. Um, so a few highlights on additional conservation programs that may be of interest to you. Um, and these programs vary for each city. Fedbosca offers a long be gone program, which provides customers rebates up to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced. And we also offer a rain barrel program, which provides rebates of up to $200 off the purchase and installation of rain barrels and cisterns. So Bosco also has added a new smart controller program, which is an irrigation controller that can be operated from using your smartphone. And last but not least, Bosco also has a rain garden rebate program, which enables residents to harvest rainwater and reduce stormwater runoff into our local creeks and the, and the San Francisco Bay. And for more information about these programs and see which ones are available in your city, just visit bayareaconservation.org. Great. So today's program is the penultimate workshop in the spring 2021 gardening series. And the last workshop will actually be focusing on irrigation equipment and leak detection, which is on June 7th. And if you missed any of our previous workshops, for example, we hosted one earlier this month on herb gardening, you can watch all of the recordings at bosca.org slash classes. And if you are looking for any additional resources on water efficient landscaping, check out the WaterWise Gardening website at bayareagardening.org. So before we get started with today's uh, workshop, we've got a few polling questions for you all, which I will be launching right now. So the first question is, we just wanna get a sense of how many years of gardening experience do you have? And the second question is, do you have any children joining us this morning? And a third question, which we couldn't fit into this polling question is we, you know, like to hear what your favorite salad ingredient is. So if you can type that up in the Q and A, um, yeah, we're curious to hear, you know, what are some fun ingredients that you like to eat and maybe, you know, we might touch upon that today. So feel free to just put that in the Q and A. 
I love it. Tomatoes, spinach, arugula, lettuce, radishes, basil, cilantro. Yes, all of these good yummies. Wonderful. Anybody else want to type in the Q and A? What they um, are, what their favorite, you know, uh, salad ingredient is. So fun. Peppers. Mine is cucumbers, homegrown cucumbers. Well, and tomatoes. How how can you you know? I can't maybe pick, but and then ra homegrown radishes. And arugula, yeah, I think all of it, right? Yes. Oh, hey, Vivian. Mm -hmm. um, onions too, I know. Once we start growing our, our own food, it's really hard to actually decide what's your favorite. I've also been enjoying the um, red mustard greens. They're very peppery and uh, sometimes they almost taste like wasabi. It's very fun. Okay, so I'll go ahead and end the poll. Mushrooms, fun. Oh yeah, what? Let me have a look at that poll. Wait. Oh, fun. Um, let's see. So it so, so it looks like most participants have less than a year of gardening experience, which is great. This is you know an introduction, um, and not a lot of children joining us today, but that's okay. All right, so I will go ahead and stop that. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our instructor today, Suzanne Bontempo. Suzanne has over 20 years of experience as a horticulture specialist and is a seasoned gardener. So please join me in welcoming Suzanne. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I have to share. I have been so inspired when I was putting this program together that I have planted uh, just about all of the vegetables and fruits that I'm mentioning in today's program. So it's very exciting. And yes, this is a salad, a neighbor of mine uh, prepared. Everything was from their own yard, their own garden. This was a couple of years ago when we had a potluck and isn't it beautiful? So today we're actually going to go through slides for about 45 minutes. I do have a lot to share with you. So um, but we are going to be pausing throughout the program. So there'll be moments where we pause and we can have time for questions. And then I'll also leave time at the end for more questions. So what we're going to learn today is how to grow a salad. It's really, we're going to talk about the best location for growing our, our salad ingredients. And then uh, are we going to grow from seed or from little vegetable starts? We're going to talk about companion planting. We're going to talk about how to plant. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of fertilizing and then how to water and how to harvest because these are a lot of questions that come up. So let's start by setting our salad garden up for success. So what I'd like to share is that it's really important that we understand before we choose the location, we understand like what location, um, what is the sunlight of those locations and what we're looking for depending on the type of vegetable we're planting is full sun, which is six hours or more, or like a part sun, part shade, and understanding if that's a morning sun or an afternoon sun, because the afternoon sun has a tendency to be a little hotter, or if it's dappled sun all day, because um, not all of the food crops we're talking about really can handle the full sun. And what I'm talking specifically about is our lettuces. Our lettuces really don't like that hot heat in the afternoon. So, uh, and they prefer uh, temperature range from 50 50 to 75 degrees. That's why it's so easy to grow lettuce in the Bay Area because we pretty much have these nice mild temperatures year round. However, um, there are some tricks if we are growing lettuces in the full sun and we do happen to have a couple of those hot days that might be uh, forecasted like the next couple days, I am prepared to put up a little shade cloth and that shade cloth will help prevent those lettuces from uh, burning or wilting because they're so uh, tender. And the shade cloth can be an umbrella from the patio that we just put up temporarily or the frost blankets we use over the winter to protect our plants from frost. We can just drape it, hang it high like a shower curtain. Uh, we always wanna make sure it's not on top of the plants that it's actually literally a curtain that's providing shade. 
And then from there, we want to find a location. Uh, is our is it are we planting up against a house or a garage or a fence that might get full sun? Because if we are, that structure can uh, reflect heat and make that area a little hotter. So that's something to keep in mind. Or are we going to plant in uh, in pots on our deck? Um, or are we going to uh, plant in the open garden space? And then from there, are we going to plant in the ground, in a raised bed, or in a container? And I apologize, I totally forgot. I wanted to uh, just briefly before we got started, talk about the handouts that we uh, that Jen emailed out to everybody. There is one that is our outline, and this is actually a worksheet that can help you, you know, work through like what are we? Um, there's some questions you can ask yourself about how, where are we planting and um, what ingredients do we wanna grow and you know what the sun exposure is. So that's something that we could be filling out when you're ready to go into your garden to have a peek. You also have the Pester Pal handout for any children in the family or any uh, you know, neighborhood kids. And then of course, a helpful garden resource page that I prepared for you that will help you uh, with your gardening. So from there, after we've decided where we're going to plant, if it's in the ground in a container or in a uh, raised bed um, and what the sun exposure is, we're going to start with the soil. We want to always start with healthy soil. Now you might already have soil in the container and of course you've already got soil uh, in your garden, but what we want to do is we want to amend that soil. We want to add compost. And the reason why we add compost is because compost is, um, loaded with a lot of life and a, a lot of food for that soil. We want to understand that compost is always going to improve the structure of the soil. It's going to increase the health by adding more soil microbiology as well as feeding the existing microbiology that's already in our soil. And this is going to be a container, a raised bed, or in the ground. And then um, when we add compost, what's really, really important, especially right now since we're moving towards this time of drought, is that it increases the water holding capacity significantly. So, so important, so important. And then just so that we understand when we go to the store, I know sometimes it's kind of confusing, but if we're buying soil in bags, understand that uh, uh, products that are called soil conditioner or uh, compost or planting mix, these are all things that are intended to be worked into the soil or or, uh, you know, we could put a nice layer on top of the soil, uh, or we can also add it to the raised beds, whereas potting soil is specifically for containers. And uh, I will even put potting soil in a half barrel. So something as large as a half uh, wine barrel that I use to plant, I am using potting, potting soil. Anything larger than that, uh, I can decide if it might just be like a raised bed mix or um, a planting mix would probably be fine. And anything that already has soil or is in the ground, I'm going to be amending with a soil conditioner or anything that says soil amend or soil amendment or, uh, or soil compost, things like that. And then from there, we decide what we want to plant. Uh, are we going to grow peas or carrots and onions, lettuces, cucumbers, radishes? Um, you know, there's, it's endless what we'd like to grow. Now, uh, most everything is fairly easy. I will share, there's one ingredient that um, is probably a little challenging, but not impossible. It's celery. Celery is, when we grow it at home, it doesn't look like how it looks when we buy it at the store. So that is going to be the one thing I'm just going to throw out there. If you're going to grow celery, you're going to want to grow it inside uh, some type of a container. Sometimes you can use one of those uh, wax covered paper uh, milk containers where we cut the bottom off because it's a tube or anything that looks like a tube that might help that lettuce, I'm sorry, that celery grow in the form that we're used to buying it in. Other than that, it flops right out, but uh, it's still fun to grow and it's still tasty. So what are some of the favorite ingredients that we've talked about? I see that we've already mentioned tomatoes and radishes and onions and arugula. Um, uh, I like to also, you know, consider berries. I grow a lot of berries. Um, I'll also share that I grow nasturtium. 
to put in my salads because it's really fun, especially for having a party because it just adds so much nice color and they're kind of peppery. Um, but so many uh, fun things, of course, it just, the list goes on, right? But something I'd like to share and introduce you to, if you're not familiar with, uh, are the whole concept of growing heirloom vegetables. So many of the foods that we can buy right now are heirlooms. We can uh, read a lot of the, um, the seed packs, we'll say heirloom on it, or even if we're buying it at the store, the little tags will say heirloom. But the reason why heirlooms are so fun is because they are uh, typically from Mediterranean regions like ours here in California, which makes them ideal for our climate which means they can really handle our summer dry environment, which means they're gonna be more drought tolerant and they're gonna be uh, water savers. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get to water them. You're still gonna water them, but they're gonna have a tendency to handle the dry heat of our summer uh, climate. And then I like to invite everyone to plant something new. So I will definitely go through seed catalogs online and I'm on Instagram and I like to check out what other people are growing. And so this year I am planting the uh, cucamelons, the mouse melons, which I saw were all the rage last year. And it is so fun to, to try something new. So I just directly sowed these seeds that are already coming up. I've already moved that irrigation line back just so that they can start to grow and expand. But it's just fun to try something new and see if you like it. Uh, annual vegetables for our salads, of course, are plants that have a one-year life cycle. So these would be lettuces, spinach, chard. A lot of our leafy greens are radishes, carrots, uh, green onions. Some onions can be perennial, but in this case, these are going to be our annuals. Uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and more. And then there's also perennial food crops that we can plant, such as the strawberries, any of the berries, uh, chives or perennials, um, you know, um, scarlet runner beans and artichokes and so forth. These are actually food crops that are going to have a two year lifespan or longer. And these are food crops that we're really going to kind of manage more like we would our perennials or our roses, things like that. So a lot of the um, the instructions that I'm going to be speaking to as we move forward is really focused on annual food crops, uh, not always the perennial food crops. So that's just something to keep in mind. And this is a really cool planting chart that I found online. This is uh, the San Francisco gardening, I believe, org. I can't see it at the top of the page, but uh, check this out. But I also gave everyone, um, I well, I shared in the resource uh, page in the book section, the Golden Gate Gardening book. This also ex is a much more expansive guide to when to plant by seed and when to plant by like a plant that we might buy. So that's something that I would encourage you to uh, have in your collection of books. It is a book that I reference all the time because um, I can't remember or keep track of all of the vegetables and their timing. I have a kind of an idea, but it's always great to reference that book. And then from there, we're going to ask ourselves, are we planting from seed? Uh, you know, and then from, if we are planting from seed, is it something that we can sow directly in the soil or is it something that is best if we start in um, uh, little starter pot pots like this, uh, these little cell packs? Um, the benefit of starting in cell packs is that we can start our seeds a little earlier, uh, maybe before the end of the frost season for our warm season crops, uh, and we could start them inside and get them started so that we can get a jump start on the planting season, or we can then continue to grow uh, by direct sowing in the seed uh, into the soil. And that's really just placing the seeds right on top of the soil. A good rule of thumb is depending on the size of the seed will dictate how deep we plant that seed. So typically I'm planting the seed about the profile of the depth, whatever that little, um, the profile length of the seed is, that's how deep I'm planting it. So like fava beans are pretty big. They're about an inch. So I'm planting them about an inch. However, carrot and lettuce seeds are minuscule. So I'm literally just kind of 
pushing them just slightly, placing them on top of the soil and pushing them down. And I might just kind of put a little dusting of soil on top just to keep them moist. But all of these packets, if you're buying seeds, will give you instructions on how deep to plant them. And if you're buying starts, starts are pretty cool because you're actually, you know, if you don't have a lot of space or if you don't want to store seeds or if you really are um, feeling a little intimidated by seeds or you just don't want to, um, you're, you're impatient like I am sometimes, we can buy plants that are already in the six packs or in a four inch pot or even a one gallon. They're already growing. You're, you're just getting that one plant or those six plants. You don't have, you know, a lot of plants with the seeds. You won't have to worry about thinning the seeds as they start to sprout. We want to make sure they have enough space to grow. So we're going to be removing a lot of them, which sometimes is a little bit uh, um, devastating for us because we don't want to, you know, uh, remove anything that was already starting to grow. But again, these tags are giving us a lot of information. So let's look at these tags. Uh, we're going to see, like, for instance, the lettuce is telling us that one, it's an heirloom, which is fantastic. It is going to be ready for harvest within 28 to 55 days, so pretty quick. It's going to grow about 12 to 18 inches at maturity, and that um, it's going to tell us a little bit of how it's going to look, whereas the carrots, we can see um, on the front, it's a cool season. Um, however, we still are in the range that we can plant now by seed. We could still direct sow seeds. It's not too late. Uh, we're going to sow from the early spring into the late summer, and then we'll be harvesting uh, anywhere from and then about 65 days from germination. So that's about two months out from uh, once we've planted them and they've germinated, we'll be able to harvest in about two months after that. And that's also an heirloom. It's kind of fun. And so when we're planting um, in our raised beds or in containers or in the ground, sometimes we don't need to fill the entire space with one food crop. You know, we're not farmers for, uh, you know, our um, economical benefit for economic benefit. We're actually home gardeners. So it's really fun just to kind of mix and match. Um, I'll always plant my plants that are uh, like to grow together together, such as the scallions and the lettuces. I'll also throw in some herbs. And of course, I always will add some flowers like uh, sweet alyssum or cosmos because I want to attract beneficial insects. So uh, give yourself permission to kind of mix things together. But what's important uh, from this really is to understand that not all plants like to be planted together. Not all plants like to share uh, the nutrients in the soil. So um, they'll actually compete for nutrients. So this is really fun. You can just do an online search for companion planting charts. I know that the uh, Farmer's Almanac has one, and I believe that Burpee Seeds also has one. Uh, this chart came from Heirloom Organics. This is very minimal, but it's just very easy to show on a screen like this. Um, most of them are very, uh, well, a lot more detail, a lot larger, so, um, and not as easy to read on a screen like this, but yeah, check it out. It's a lot of fun. And then we can um, plant more variety in a single planting area. All right, we just got started, but I'd like to see if anybody has any questions. Yes, so we have a question um, from one of our participants. Do you amend potting soil with compost? Great question, yes, I do. Um, thank you for asking that, because that's actually a question that comes up a lot. I will amend because, you know, Here's the thing, my whole container is potting soil. And something else you'll notice is potting soil has a tendency to shrink, it like disappears. The plants really are enjoying those nutrients. So I'll need to raise it up some. So I'm gonna add about 5% compost. So I'm gonna add probably like an inch or two of compost. And then I'm just gonna lightly, just lightly rake it in or scratch it into the top like inch or so of my soil. When I'm planting my plants, let's say if my four inch plants are a little deeper than my compost, I might even throw a little handful of compost 
with my fertilizer in that planting hole. But yes, that compost is going to integrate in time because of the microbiology that is in our containers and in the compost. Great. And um, another compost related question, how much compost do you add to amend? Typically you can uh, add about, uh, I'd say about 5% uh, ish. So I, if I have just a raised bed or in ground, I'm gonna put an inch of compost on top and then I'm gonna turn it into the top like four inches of the soil. And that's really going to, you know, have now nice like five inch range of compost. So about what? So that's about ten percent. So something around there. We're not. We don't have to go crazy. Uh, but then again, if your soil is really, really dry and it really seems like lifeless, then you might want to add a little bit more. But what we want to be aware of is just creating a nice balance. Compost is really just an additive uh, that we're adding to the soil to make that soil more rich and more alive. Uh, but we really want to keep that structure of the um, of the soil uh, in a place where, you know, it's got nice water holding capacity. It's got some air so that the roots and the uh, earthworms can move through it with ease. The water can move through it. Um, you know, uh, infiltrate down and percolate out and then evaporate with ease. Uh, sometimes if it's, there's too much organic matter, it is not going to be a nice balance. So really we're just looking at that's kind of having a nice 5% ish range of organic matter in our soil. Okay. Um, another question, what is a walking onion? Oh yeah, a walking onion, it's a trip. Um, I just learned about them recently. Um, it's a uh, onion, look it up online, it's crazy. It's an onion. And then when it goes to flower, that flower gets really heavy. What's really the seed pod of that plant gets really heavy. So it will fall down, it'll lay down, and then the seeds will then plant, you know, create a new plant and it will grow and do the same thing. So it's almost like it's walking and it's a perennial. So very strange. Oh, that's so funny. I just I Googled it and yeah, the images are pretty gnarly. It's kind of a trip. Yeah. All right. And then um, the last two questions we'll do uh, um, and then we'll move on. Uh, one, how do you dig in compost? And two, when do seed packets get too old to use? Oh yeah, those are both really good questions. Uh, the way I dig compost in is literally either with a cultivator or uh, with your trowel. Um, you can even use a small shovel. I don't usually use my big like normal gardening shovel until I'm like in the ground and if I really have to amend a large area. Um, typically I'm trying to avoid scratching in or disrupting the root systems. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, limit how much I disrupt the soil biology. So I'm really just kind of doing a light turning on the top, and then I'm going to protect that soil with mulch. Understand there's like uh, beneficial bacteria and fungi that, especially this fungi, will have webbing that we maybe can see or maybe we won't see. It's white webbing called hyphae, and I want to um, try to avoid disrupting that as much as possible. So it's just really kind of lightly on the top because it, it will work its way into the soil. And then seeds, well, I gotta be honest, I've got some seed packs here from 2018 and 2015 and I'm still planting them. Um, what that uh, date on the back of the seed packet is telling us is that every single seed in here is 100% guaranteed to 100% germinate by the sell by date. So the fact that I've got some seeds here from 2015, I've been storing them in a cool dry location to keep them fresh, not the refrigerator, but uh, a cupboard that stays very cool and dry. And um, you know, if not all of them germinate, I'm okay with that, but I'm still having um, some success with these. So until I can use them all up, um, I will not buy any more of the red um, garnet romaine lettuce. So they stay for a long time if they're stored properly. Great. All right. So we're going to move on, but feel free to keep putting in your questions in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end. 
Okay, so as I shared, I like to um, kind of mix my plants together. Uh, I'm not always just doing lines. Sometimes I am, but for the most part, I'm integrating flowers, herbs, and food crops, so anything that can uh, grow together that's a companion plant. I'm taking advantage of all the space I have. And you can imagine um, something like planting uh, in clusters on a diamond grid or a hex pattern. Um, this is a way that we can actually plant more food and have a longer harvest season. And what I mean by that is this bed right here looks pretty tight, wouldn't you say? I planted it on that hex in these clusters, but I'm harvesting every other plant. So this was right before I did a harvest. I'm harvesting every other plant. And as I do that, I'm thinning the plants. So there's more space for them to grow. But what is the benefit of this is that because these plants are growing, they're now uh, protecting themselves. Uh, the soil is going to stay protected, reducing water evaporation because it's shaded. The soil is now staying cooler because we want the temperatures of the soil to stay fairly regular. You know, we always want to protect that soil with mulch and or planting in a way where that the roots are shaded. And then from here, you see the variety. Um, there's really just, uh, there's quite a bit of variety here. It might look like it's just about four plants, but there's actually a lot of different types of greens that now and I can go through and harvest either the whole plant or thin out the outer leaves, which I'll talk about in a minute, to then give more space for the new leaves, the new plants to grow. Now, of course, this isn't going to necessarily work with some things like tomatoes or summer squash, but you get the idea for some of the plants that are that really grow as leafy greens, especially with like uh, radishes and carrots. The carrots are growing below ground and the leafy greens are growing above ground. So we can get a lot of different variety in a small space. And then when we're planting, we want to tease the roots. So again, we use this handy dandy tool, which I love. And um, these might not be the best example, but when we buy a cell pack or we buy a four inch plant, sometimes the root systems are even a little bit more where they've wrapped around. And it's really important that we, um, we open up these root systems a bit. We tease them because if not, if we just plant them straight in the ground like this, the roots are already... Um, uh, guiding themselves into the form of the pot. And we really want to guide them out. We really want to encourage them to grow out. So here is the six pack I bought. I really was only able to get a couple. There's so many plants. So what happens is, is that when we get a cell pack, sometimes we get a lot more than just six plants. There's actually about four to six plants per cell pack. And what we want to do is we want to open them up. And a question that... Um, Jen was asking me, um, Jennifer was asking before the program is how do we do this without disturbing the roots? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this tool or I'm gonna use like a toothpick or like a skewer and I'm just gonna lightly kind of massage and this is just lightly damp. We wanna do it when it's not bone dry but we're just gonna lightly massage these and we're gonna massage the soil off. And as we massage the soil off, we start to see and expose the roots. And they start to just kind of open up. So you see, I'm not really using a lot of force, but you can see the root systems are starting to open up. And then just like if you ever had a knot in your hair, you're able to kind of comb the roots from the bottom and then you'll be able to divide the plants. So um, keep that in mind. They can handle it. They're tough. You want to uh, try to avoid ripping the roots on the littles, but if you have a larger pot, like a four inch, you can really, uh, uh, you want to take that, um, you know, your, your planting tag and you really kind of do want to score the sides pretty well. But the little seed packs, the little seedlings, when they're really young and tender, you want to try to comb them out. And then you'll see in this planter, maybe it's not so easy, but it was just two cell packs. It's over 12 plants. I was able to space appropriately and put in to my uh, little planting tub. And so from there, we're going to look at these tags again. Remember I said we have the planting dates. 
of um, harvest. So lettuces are pretty fast growers. You see here time to harvest from germination is anywhere from 28 to 55 days, whereas the carrots are going to be a little longer. So keeping this in mind, I want to then plant in a way that is going to give me uh, harvestable crops for uh, a while. So carrots are really fantastic to start uh, seeding in the succession planting uh, every few weeks so that we can have carrots every few weeks. We don't want to plant all the carrots at one time because then we'd have to kind of harvest them fairly quickly. And lettuces too, because they grow so quickly, um, this is funny, I have a tendency to always forget to grow uh, my lettuces in succession. So what happens is I get all this lettuce and I'm making all these salads and then they all I, I run out of food crops to harvest. So um, this is just something that's kind of neat to consider. Now, it doesn't have to be in one bed like this. You can have it all around your garden, um, which is what I have where I have lettuces here and there, mature ones are harvesting where I've planted my tomatoes. And um, so I'll have my lettuces harvested by the time my tomatoes get too big. So you can kind of take advantage of different types of spaces. Sorry, I made a real big mess here that I was just trying to wipe away. All right, so any questions about that really quick before we move into the next section? Because the planting sometimes can be a little uh, tricky. Yeah, so we have a few questions. Not uh, totally related, but I'll just ask them. So uh, one person's asking my, or saying that my jalapeno peppers didn't have any peppers last year. And they're wondering um, why that could be. Um, for example, was it maybe not enough sun or fertilizer? I'd like to ask, were there any flowers? Because uh, peppers are going to pr pr produce their fruit, uh, the, the food from the flower, like tomatoes. So that's something we want to look at, just like summer squash is producing its food from the flowers. And then um, as far as jalapenos, I'd have to look it up if it requires getting pollinated or if it's self-pollinating. I'm not sure off the top of my head. And then from there, I would ask, did it get, uh, was it in the right growing location? Did it get enough heat? It doesn't necessarily need full sun all day. In fact, I plant my peppers behind my tomatoes so that they get morning sun all the way into the afternoon. But then when that afternoon heat really comes on, they're shaded by my tomatoes. Um, I found that that kind of protects them, which is funny. They like the heat, but they, they where I live, they don't necessarily like that full hot sun in the afternoon. But um, was the plant maybe uh, getting too much water? Did it not get enough water? Did you feed it? These are all questions that I would ask. And then from there, we just take a mental note and then we try again next year to see how we can improve. Great. And then we have a couple of questions regarding rodents. Um, so uh, should we hold off until later? Will you talk about that? I'm not really talking about pest problems directly, but I can answer questions about pest problems. Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and um, ask those questions. Uh, yeah. Should we ask them now? Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so one person's hoping that you'll speak about it, but um, I guess maybe for that participant, if you have any specific questions, um, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. But a separate person asks, is a raised bed better if I have a lot of gophers? Oh yeah, that is a great question. Absolutely. And when you raise, when you plant in your raised bed, the benefits of raised beds is that uh, if you have really crummy clay soil and it's really hard to plant, put in a raised bed, make sure you've lined it with gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth that's galvanized wire mesh that's half inch in size. And then you can put the nicest soil you want, a nice raised bed uh, planting mix in, and then you're good, but absolutely. And then um, like all of my containers that I have outside in the open ground, I have drilled holes in them, but I even put, uh, I set those containers on top of gopher wire, just because uh, over time, especially those tubs, they'll start to rust a little bit. And I've had gophers, 
uh, kind of find their way into that tub to eat the roots. And I also, if I have a vegetable like summer squash that's trailing over and will be resting on the ground, I even put a perimeter of the gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth on the ground around the food crop with mulch on top of it because I've had those gophers eat my squashes and you don't even know until you go to harvest and the whole thing's um, hollow, so. Oh no, that sounds yeah. terrible. Okay, and then we'll do uh, one more question for now and then we'll move on, but keep putting your questions in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end. So for uh, this last question, just for this section, do you recommend planting radishes in deep pots? Oh. All of my plants are in pots because I live in an apartment. Yeah, that's a great question. You can absolutely plant uh, radishes in a deep container, although I'll take advantage of the fact that they don't need to be in deep containers because so many other things do. So I have some shallow tubs that are probably just about, um, well, let's just say 12 inches deep. So I'm only planting maybe about 10 inches. And I have um, the breakfast radishes and I haven't planted my watermelon radishes yet but none of them are that big so they grow really well and they're so fast they really are coming up in a matter of uh, days and then you're harvesting in just a matter of weeks so radishes are excellent in shallower containers just make sure all the containers uh, drain really well. That's the key. We wanna make sure we've drilled holes in them or that they have holes and that they're draining and the pots are all sitting up so that that can drain. I like to use pot feet or little um, risers. I don't put them right in my saucers unless it's a plant that really likes to have wet feet. Uh, but I really like to make sure my plants drain well. Great. And with right. that, uh, why don't we go ahead and move on? Okay, thanks. So let's talk about feeding. So there's a lot of fertilizers out there on the market. I'm a huge advocate for working with organics. Um, they're just going to be a much better uh, way to feed, but we are looking at dry fertilizers that look like kind of a crushed meal or liquid. And dry fertilizers, we're going to work into the soil or uh, put it in the planting hole at time of planting. We really like that fertilizer to be in direct contact with the root systems that you don't have to worry about burning your plants unlike synthetics, uh, but this is really food for the microorganisms. And when we get that, feeding, start feeding those microorganisms, they start this symbiotic relationship with the root systems of our plants to um, increase the nutrient and uh, water uptake. They really assist with uh, getting our the root systems of our plants more food and more water because they're really tiny and they're very efficient. And uh, it's a much more sustainable way to feed our plants because our plants are now able to take the nutrients on an as need basis. It's not gonna work like, like a steroid for our plants. Um, and it's also going to uh, prevent uh, a lot of stimulation of new growth, which we see really attracts a lot of pest problems. And the way we apply it is really, there we are with that cultivator, just kind of scratching it into the top couple inches of the soil around the plants, trying to avoid disturbing the plant roots too much. But at time of planting, we're just going to put it in that planting hole. And then liquid fertilizers. Uh, I'm a huge fan of working with liquid fertilizers because throughout the growing season, it's very easy to use. We're going to read the directions on the label and I will mix it with my with water in my watering can. And I'm just watering about every week to every other week. I'm going around and watering around the drip line or the outer edge of all of my plants uh, just to give them a little boost. Because our food crops are giving us food, we need to give them food. And my annual food crops, I'm going to be feeding with uh, liquid fertilizer throughout the growing season. I'm always adding dry fertilizer at the time of planting. And of course, I will annually fertilize my perennial food crops with uh, fertilizer. But through the growing season for my annual food crops, like lettuces and tomatoes, I am fertilizing with liquid fertilizer about every week to every other week. And the way we apply it is with our watering can. It's so easy. 
All right. And then I want to share, don't forget about our flowers because we want to attract our beneficial insects. This is really important. And we really want to attract them with plants that look like daisies or sunflowers or uh, plants that are in tiny clusters such as yarrow or sweet alyssum. And I'll share, I always dot, I'll get a six pack of sweet alyssum and I'll put one or two among a huge uh, planting area of my lettuces, uh, my roses, um, my peppers and tomatoes. I'm a huge fan of sweet alyssum because it's pretty easy to buy. It's also easy to grow by seed. I also love Coreopsis, I'm sorry, Cosmos. I'll plant them too because there are well, Coreopsis are awesome too, but they attract beneficial insects, specifically the hoverflies, which um, and the lacewings, which their larvae really love the aphids and other little insects just as much as the ladybugs do. And sunflowers are just really fantastic because not only do we get to harvest the seeds, which I love toasted. Uh, sunflower seeds in my salads, but they're also really great for the pollinators. So this is a really fun plant to grow. So uh, any questions about what we just talked about? Um, we do have some questions, not uh, completely related, but um, I'll just go ahead and ask a couple. Yeah. Um, how do you plant a tomato plant from the store? Oh, that's a great question. So tomatoes are funny. Um, they are one. They are one of the few plants that we actually want to bury deep. So when we have a tomato plant, we'll have that stalk, and it'll have a couple of leaves, and then a couple of leaves, and maybe like a couple of little branchlets. I'm gonna nip off the bottom two little branchlets. Um, you can also nip off the leaves if you want, and then I'm going to plant it between where I just removed those leaves and just right under where the next set of leaves are growing. So it's kind of, I'm kind of planting it halfway between those two nodes. And, um, and that is really wonderful. And if you even have a super tall plant that you've got, cause sometimes at the garden centers right now, the plants are even taller than this. You can even go down a couple, you know, like a couple of nodes deep. And then anything else like lettuces, um, cucumbers, I'm planting right at the soil level, slightly high, because I'm going to want to allow to put a nice layer of mulch around there. So I'm always planting it just ever so slightly high so that I can put mulch out here to protect that soil. Great. And let's see, any recommendations on how to water seeds? For example, how much and how often? That's a good question. We're actually going to talk about that next. So is there another question, Jen, uh, by chance, Jennifer? Um, let's see. Well, there is a, uh, we got some few questions, but actually there's one related to liquid fertilizer since okay. that one's a little bit more relevant. I'll jump to that one. Um, so for liquid fertilizer, is it necessary to try not to make sure um, any of it gets on the vegetable plant leaves? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. When we're working with organic fertilizers, like the uh, a fish and kelp combination, or like an all-purpose from like down to earth or garden and bloom, or any of these, it's a really nice combination between the fish emulsion or fish hydrolysate and kelp and bat guano and earthworm castings, all of this, you know, read the direction, or I'm sorry, read the ingredients on the label, make sure these are all ingredients that you're okay with. But when it's organic, they can get on the leaves because what's happening is that now the leaves are actually also taking those nutrients through the cells. So it is, um, when we're working with liquid fertilizers, I like to equate it to us drinking like a green juice. It The plants are able to, take in those nutrients a lot faster, almost more immediately than a dry fertilizer. The dry fertilizer is going to uh, uh, offer a longer sustainable food where the liquid fertilizer is really more of a faster uh, uptake for those plants. And it also is absorbing through the cells of the leaves. So it's not a problem. Great, thank you. Well, okay. we go ahead and move on. 
Okay, super. So I want to talk about when we're planting seeds. So when we're planting those little seedlings, they're, they're nothing at the beginning. I mean, they're just little seeds at the very surface of the soil. So I really want to make sure I'm not letting those seeds dry out too much. I do want them to get dried out some, but I don't want them to go all day. So I might be watering my seedlings with the watering can because the seedlings don't have any roots. So we're really just watering the top of the soil just to keep them damp. Okay, but once they start to germinate and those uh, uh, roots start to grow, we want to encourage those roots to grow down and out. And we can only do that with water because the roots are only going to go where the water goes. So what we want to encourage is deep root systems by watering deeply. So as the plant grows, above ground, we can see the root systems, or, or we can't see, but we can imagine the root systems are growing um, below ground. What we want to avoid is shallow. And shallow in a lot of these cases is just a couple inches or really just down to five inches or so, because I want to show you here, these carrots, these beets, the tomatoes, this is foot. This is like the tomato roots can go down four plus feet, pepper roots, four plus feet. Okay, beet, the beet roots go down, heck, 10 feet. I can't even believe that. Now, we're not watering in a way that really we're watering for so long that water is going to get all the way down to 10 feet. We really want to judge on the plants once they're more mature that the water is getting down about five inches because it's still going to keep, you know, moving down. But we're just trying to gauge the water to get down to about, you know, about this deep once established. But as they're growing, the root systems are small. So we're still kind of, you know, um, feeding the root systems a little bit more at a time as the plant grows. So this is a really good way to see. So our plant has germinated, the root system is very tiny, but do you see how just from the picture on the, let's say the second one from the left, maybe is just about an inch all the way to the picture on the full right, which is already now down about four inches. We're gonna be watering much differently. And this is how we want to encourage the root systems to grow a little deeper. And then the picture on the right, I'm gonna let the top inch of the soil dry before I water that again. Because if I keep it too wet, we're gonna start to see uh, different diseases and pathogens. And we're gonna start to th see uh, plants um, wilt and die from like damp off because they're staying too wet. Plants want to dry out. Uh, they need to have that oxygen in the soil uh, so that they can dry just as much as they need the water in the soil, as well as the other nutrients. So when we're buying a plant, so here's that example. I bought a four inch plant. It's exactly the shape of that four inch pot. This root, root system was a lot more dense than the root system from my cell pack that I showed. And what I want to do is I want to score those sides. I want to score the bottom and then I plant it and I want to really encourage those root systems to grow out and down. So I know that this is an illustration of a tree, but this applies to all of our plants. We want to focus the water and the food at the drip line of the plant. So when we look back at this picture, I am focusing on the outside edge of that plant because I want to encourage those roots to grow out and down. I'm not watering it at the crown where the stem and the root system meets, I'm watering it out here because that's where the roots are. That's where the fibrous feeding roots are. So you can see that in this illustration that I'm really watering out here. And especially when our plants become really established like our summer squash, our tomatoes, those root systems are way beyond the uh, support systems of those plants. And then when we water, we want to focus the water at the soil. We don't want to, we want to try to avoid watering the leaves as much as possible so that we can avoid um, encouraging diseases like black spot or rust. However, if we do get powdery mildew, powdery mildew actually thrives on dry conditions, not wet. So if we do have powdery mildew, if we um, are not able to cut off those older leaves that are infected, we can simply just wash those leaves off and those spores will pop. They'll just get washed away. But we really want to make sure we are doing that early enough in the day so that rest of those water uh, molecules can dry before sundown, not to um, 
encourage black spot or any other diseases. But we're always focusing the water at the root system. And then of course we can work with uh, soaker hoses or watering cans. Uh, soaker hoses, we wanna make sure we're actually, um, this is a brand new tomato seedling. So the root system is still very close, but in time I might move that uh, soaker hose back out about four to six inches as that plant grows. And then if we're working with drip systems, we want to understand that uh, as the plant grows, we're going to want to move those emitters out and around. We want to really, our goal is to make sure we're watering uh, evenly all the way around the plant. And that again, we're able to really get that water down a good uh, five, six inches and that we're not watering again until the top few inches of that soil is dry, depending on the plant and its water needs. So how do we know if we're overwatering or underwatering? We want to feel the soil. So uh, we might have a layer of mulch on top that is going to, um, you know, look like the soil is dry, I mean, you know, because the, the mulch is dry. Or if we don't have mulch, that top layer of soil can look dry because of sun exposure and wind. But we need to feel, especially in our containers, because the containers, especially the smaller ones, have a tendency to hold more water. So we need to get in there and we have to feel the soil. We can also use moisture meters, but it's really important because uh, plants can actually uh, wilt when they're overwatered. Okay, so uh, it's another way of stress. It's actually them starting to die. Uh, here's a picture of a tomato that was overwatered, and it's just, it's like, I'm not happy. I'm getting too much water. So, really important it's in the beginning to feel your soil so that you really have a good idea that you really can get in that rhythm of knowing how fast that water is evaporating out of your soil. And especially since we're putting a nice layer of mulch on top, which is so important this time of year, um, is to really get a sense of how fast it's um, drying out. Now here, we also wanna know, do your plants need supports? Do we need to support them with tomato cages or with trellises or with stakes? Uh, I have a tendency to use those uh, round, uh, smaller tomato uh, cages for um, my uh, cucumbers and such. However, I like the larger cages or even a trellis. I'll grow my uh, sun golds and other small cherry tomatoes actually on a trellis because then it's much easier to kind of weave them and tie them up. But in this case, these are those uh, the square uh, collapsible cages that are a little larger that I love. They're great. Stakes also work really well. And then um, I've mentioned a number of times now how important mulch is. I am mulching my food crops. Uh, that's my corn on the top. Uh, and then of course, just walkways on the bottom. But right now, I, I normally use a rice straw for my food crops. I really like rice straw. It's really easy to move around seedlings. It's easy for seedlings to grow through it. However, since we're really in a much drier, warmer, uh, season already. It started much earlier this year. Um, I'm using a nice uh, arbor mulch. Um, any protective layer that's an organic material, it could be little fir bark chips, it could be cedar, shredded cedar uh, bark. Um, this is just the arbor mulch I got at the local landscape supply store. And I am putting it around my plants once they've sprouted. And it reduces water evapor evaporation rate significantly. It also allows the water to really soak into the soil without running off because soil, when it's dry, it becomes hydrophobic and water will just kind of just run right off. It takes a minute. It's like a sponge. If you have a sponge that's dry and hard and you put it under the faucet, it takes a minute for the water to penetrate to the center. The edge starts to get soft, but the center is still hard until it makes it all the way in. Soil is the same way. So when I have that nice layer of mulch on top, especially on my container plants, it's not going to run off the side and down the containers taking soil with it. It allows the water just to percolate right in. It also is going to regulate the uh, temperatures for my root systems, keeping them uh, a little bit more um, 
uh, moderate where it doesn't have those temperature swings of too hot and too cold. It really protects my soil organisms. And it also feeds the soil or organisms as it breaks down. Uh, it's going to reduce weeds and it's also going to reduce soil compaction. So these are all really important things. And then when we're harvesting, this is kind of fun. So people ask me a lot of times how to harvest, which seems like a silly question. Um, but what we're doing is on tomatoes, the tomatoes literally have like a little knuckle. You just pop them off at the knuckle. I also wanna do a side uh, note. If you see the tomato on the left, I have pruned it up. Once those tomatoes are really in full, like grown, uh, usually by July, I've already started a little bit. I've started lightly pruning them from the bottom up. And the reason why I want to prune them up about 18 inches at maturity is because it really allows for some more air circulation. And it also will prevent a lot of critters like, uh, the field mice, the voles, and the rats. Because there's exposure, they're less likely to go in there um, because they know their prey. I'm not gonna say they're uh, absolutely going to avoid it because they certainly can still get in there and eat your tomatoes, but it just helps you know, um, preventing some pest problems. Okay. And then lettuces and other leafy greens, I go out there with the scissors and I cut the edges. I'm not harvesting the entire head unless that's something I want to do. Like today, I know I'm getting um, a lettuce that's about to bolt. We're starting to get some heat. So I harvested it for a salad that later this afternoon. But a lot of times I'm just harvesting the outer edges. And you're going to see some lettuces that you can buy are called cut and come again. It's because we're cutting them and they're going to continue to grow from the center out. And then some plants, uh, this is parsley where I just direct sowed some seeds. We're also looking at, um, you know, carrots and even lettuce seeds. We're going to have to thin them. We're going to have to go through and pull out some of the plants uh, to reduce the crowding because when it's crowded, they're just not going to be able to grow as well. They're competing for nutrients and water. So uh, we really want to make sure we're thinning and we can still throw those sprouts into our lettuce, uh, our salads if they're edible. And then we've already had some questions about pests. What I'd like to share is that pest identification is key. We really wanna make sure we've identified the pest because not all the bugs in the garden are actually bad bugs. A lot of them are good bugs that we mistake as pests. We wanna understand the life cycle of that insect or that bug because uh, sometimes they're very short lived um, and sometimes it's not uh, a pest that we actually need to uh, eradicate. It will kind of move on on its own. We want to understand the habitat and the timing of that pest. It really helps us with management as well as understanding what are the natural enemies of that pest. I already mentioned like the surfid fly or the hoverfly as well as the lacewing because both of them, though they are both a nectar feeders, it's their larvae that are going to be eating the pests. So that's why I like to plant alyssum and cosmos specifically right near my vegetables, as well as other flowering plants throughout my garden. And then some really cool books that I just like to share that these are books I'm referencing on a regular basis. I already mentioned the Golden Gate Gardening book. Uh, again, this is not just for San Francisco. It's really for, a, you know, all the way out the greater Bay Area. Um, and then of course the Sunset uh, Garden Book of Edibles. This one's so fun and there's so many beautiful photos. And then this really fun book. I love the Brooklyn Botanical Garden series. There's so many great books. There's one for children, uh, gardening with children and this edible gardening. They're just little, they're fun. If you find them at used bookstores, pick them up. And then of course for pest problems, uh, the online resources that we have is of course the Our Water Our World website, which has a list of fact sheets that will help guide you through less toxic pest problem solving for specific topics like ants or aphids. Um, and then the UCIPM website is really going to be the wealth of information. If we have a, pet, uh, a plant that's getting nibbled or we don't even know what the pest is, let's just say lettuce. Let's type lettuce in that search bar and all the pest problems of lettuce is going to come up. And then from there, we can kind of figure out what was it? Is it slugs and snails or is it earwigs or roly polies? 
uh, you know, it really helps us identify what the pest is and then we can adjust the mode of action for management. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us. I'm going to get out there and plant the rest of my lettuces today, as well as planting some of these seeds. I'm excited to get some spinach and some carrot in the ground. So I'd just like to thank you. And if any questions ever come up, please don't hesitate to email me. You can reach me at my website, Plant Harmony, or my email, Suzanne at Plant Harmony. Follow me on Instagram. I've got a lot of fun pictures. You'll even see the picture of, uh, there's a video of me revealing a very large zucchini squash that the gophers completely um, chewed out and hollowed last fall. So a lot of fun. Great. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, I just love that image of the salad with the nasturtium and the edible flowers. That just yeah. is very delicious. It's beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Great. So we're going to start with the Q&A. So we'll just start at the very top. Um, so this is a two-part question. Uh, one, what plants like hot sun? And two, what sort of support do snap peas need? Oh, so I'll start with the snap peas. Snap peas are going to be really great on a trellis that can be flat or TP or any type of A-frame trellis. I have an A-frame that I've built um, that is really out of like um, bamboo poles or any type, if you've got any type of a uh, tree that has fairly straight limbs that you pruned last fall or last winter, I will keep the limbs and, you know, cut off any side branches to use as supports. And then I make an A-frame and then I use uh, twine to then make it a little bit denser for, um, for my green beans and my peas to grow on. And as far as full sun, we're gonna look at tomatoes. Uh, well, gosh, just about everything likes the full sun. What's gonna prefer shade is gonna be sorrel or rhubarb, um, but things that are Things that might prefer uh, morning sun, afternoon shade, I would say would be lettuces, any of the leafy greens, chard, kale, even some of our brassicas like uh, broccoli and so forth. Um, but I have everything pretty much in full sun, but because it's starting to get hot, I'm starting to find uh, more afternoon shady places for my lettuces because they're a little bit more tender. Okay. And then can you remind us, what was the name of that cloth you use for gophers at the bottom of the bed? Oh yeah, I know it's funny. Um, it's called hardware cloth, but let me tell you, if you go to a hardware store or a home improvement store and you ask an associate where you can find the hardware cloth, they're gonna look at you like you're crazy because no one knows that's what it's called. I like to ask for fencing material or poultry wire. And then if you go over to where the poultry wire is, chicken wire or fencing material, you'll see it's, um, it's hardware cloth, it's galvanized wire mesh. So you can imagine what like a, a hamster cage or a mouse cage is made out of. It's kind of like that, but a little bit more nimble. And um, what we're looking at is a quarter inch size because that will prevent the gophers from coming in. If we're trying to prevent uh, rodents from coming in like mice or rats, we can make one out of quarter inch hardware cloth and we can make a cage that goes on top that also will prevent birds and such. Okay, thanks. And this is a two part question. One, how long do you water seedlings and germinated plants? And two, is a gentle water flow better? Those are really good questions. So I'm watering my seedlings. I wanna make sure they're kind of evenly moist and just drying out for a short period of time. Short period of time is kind of, um, you know, uh, up to you, I guess. It's kind of hard to um, dis determine, but I'm watering, let's just say that one, I have a new planter of uh, lettuce seeds. I'm watering in the morning. I have a very light dusting of seed starting mix on top. Um, and then I'm checking in the afternoon to see, oh, the, did they, is the soil right below the surface dry or wet? If it's dry, I'm watering them with the watering can. And if it's wet, I'm going to wait. So you just kind of want to check a couple times a day to make sure they're not drying out too much. 
it's really tough if you've got a full sun area that gets pretty hot, you might be watering the seedlings three times a day, but I'd probably say once to twice a day is average. And then, um, Jen, wait, I'm sorry, what was the other part of that question? Oh, is a gentle water oh, yeah. better? Yes, we definitely want to use a gentle uh, watering. We don't want to water so hard that we're like moving the soil. You know how we've had, you've seen that when you've watered with like a stronger stream, the soil or the mulch actually gets moved. With the seeds, we want to be very gentle. So that's why uh, I have a watering wand that has a head on it that really lets the water out a very light shower not the fine mist, although you could use the mist. You can also use a spray bottle of water. That's what I use for my seed packs in um, those where I've made them in, you know, where I'm planting in the seed packs. I'm just misting them with water because they're so little. There's not a lot of soil. Yeah, there you go, Jen. <laughs> and then, um, but outside in my uh, tubs where I have the planters of seeds, I have a small watering can that has very fine holes in it. So the water is coming out in a very fine rate. Got it. And then uh, speaking of watering, do you put the drip hose below the mulch? I do, I do. I Once my plants have, um, if I've planted by seed, uh, if I've direct sowed seed and I wait for them to germinate, I will then, cause I'm always planting my seeds right near the drip line so that the drip line is providing water to the seeds. But then as the seeds have germinated and start to grow, I will move that drip line over a bit to encourage the roots to go, you know, to grow out a little bit more and make sure that water isn't right at the crown of that plant because I don't want those plants to rot. But then I will, um, and I also adjust the irrigation to make sure, am I getting nice coverage everywhere I need it? And then yes, I put a nice layer of mulch on top to protect that water and the soil. And then also just to cover the irrigation because you know it, I don't always like to see it. It looks much nicer when you don't see it, but it also keeps those irrigation lines cooler. Mm, yeah, that's definitely good to know. I've definitely walked around the city. I've noticed lots of exposed drip irrigation lines and I'm wondering, hmm, I'm pretty sure those should be covered. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, next question. How deep should container plants dry out before watering again? That's a really challenging one because um, one, I prefer to plant in terracotta because the water wicks out and it will dry out down below um, a little faster. I mean, fast is, is kind of uh, irrelevant, but it's kind of, if we have plastic, the, the bottom of the pot has a tendency to say wet longer and I want the pots the soil to dry out a little bit more evenly, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And that's why I like terracotta. However, I have some professional friends that are like, absolutely do not plant your, um, don't plant in terracotta because it dries out too quickly, like tomatoes, it just dries out too quickly. However, if you have mulch on top, you have to monitor it. You have to feel, uh, you, that's why using um, one of those moisture meters to get down low is good or get your trowel and dig down a little bit. We really wanna see, and that's why I put my pots up on pot feet. I elevate it or on bricks or even on tiles, just so that they're able to drain well. I have nice air circulation and flow. And then I've got mulch on top and I'm checking to make sure. What I want to avoid is the roots down below being really wet all the time. That's what I'm trying to get at. It really depends on, is it a glazed container? Is it plastic? Is it black plastic plastic versus white plastic? The black is going to um, be hotter, hold more heat. Is it a grow bag? Those grow, those grow out very quickly. You know, there's, it just kind of depends. Is it a wooden container? Definitely, good. Um, oh, and this is an interesting question. What are your thoughts on sheet mulching with wood chips? Is it better with or without cardboard? Oh yeah, sheet mulching is when we layer layers of cardboard out overlapping so that we do not see the soil at all. We don't want any sunlight to touch the soil. We're really covering, doing a nice coverage with cardboard. We're gonna lightly dampen that and then we're gonna put no less than three inches of chips on top of that. We can always do a layer of compost and then a layer of uh, wood chips or mulch 
um, it doesn't matter what the combination is, but the it's the magic number is no less than three inches. And then we watered in really good. I'll tell you, sheet mulching is amazing. I do all my paths with sheet mulching because it prevents weeds for, well, in this case, it was two years ago that I sheet mulched and it was just starting to break down and weeds were starting to come up. So I reweeded the area and did another layer. Um, the other thing is, is that the sheet mulching will increase the health of the soil. So if you've got a really crummy area of your garden that is just dry and really hard to dig in, give yourself a break and just sheet mulch that area, do a nice layer of compost, then cardboard, compost, and then mulch on top and just let it sit there for the next 18 months. That uh, all the life in the soil, I don't know where it comes from, but it appears. Earthworms show up and all this stuff. And after that 18 month period, you're gonna have beautiful soil. So sheet mulching is amazing. Yeah, I also really like sheet mulching because you don't need to put like harsh chemicals or pesticides to kill your lawn. You really just need to cover it so that there's no sun exposure to the grass. And you know, what a neat way to naturally oh, yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'll just step the weeds down and I put the cardboard right on top of the weeds mm -hmm. and then I put the mulch on top and then those weeds will get decomposed and that's nitrogen for the soil. Yeah. And if you also want to recycle, I'm sure lots of us have oh. extra packaging from oh, yeah. Amazon deliveries. And so if you just rip off the tape, you have, you know, a good source of cardboard without having to buy it. So yeah. Another exactly. for sheet mulching. All right, exactly. moving on. Uh, when and how do you prune an indeterminate cherry tomato? I think the uh, maybe the common name is Chadwick. Uh, the cherry indeterminate or determinate. Um, first, with the determinate, you want to know what's the maximum height because you don't want to prune it too much if it's really just supposed to be a little, you know, like a container or patio. Uh, you know, tomato that's only going to get like a couple feet, but indeterminates, you know, we know that they can grow 10 feet if we let them. Um, at some point, I'm going to, I'm going to start pruning the top of them because I want to limit how tall and I want more fruit production around here. So I do start to prune it, but that's usually around August ish when my plants, I mean, I don't start really harvesting until July, uh, end of July. So I'm a little later uh, with my tomatoes. You might be a little earlier, but um, uh, uh, usually I will start pruning up as the plant grows. So usually if the plant is already um, eight inches tall, I'll prune the bottom two inches. So about, you know, uh, relatively 25% of it, but up until that plant, uh, until I've pruned about 12 to 18 inches, I'm not going to prune any further up. I just want to be able to have some nice airflow and be able to reach and harvest and access underneath um, the plant. And then when it gets up here, um, you can, I'd also invite you to check out some YouTube videos on how to prune your tomatoes because there's ways to prune um, the laterals that are coming out to make it so that it's a healthier plant and you have a uh, um, heartier or more abundant food production without it being too uh, heavy or weighted. But at the end of the season, I am also pruning the top of my plant to reduce its um, size. Got I don't it. know if that was a very good answer, but. Um, all right. So a uh, pest related question, are ants a problem at all or are they beneficial to the soil? They're well, both. Ants um, can be beneficial because they're aerating the soil. They're also eating other insects. Um, and, but they can be a problem when they are um, trailing up our plants. Well, actually they can be a problem when there's too many, right? Too much of anything can be a problem, but ants are going to be an indicator to us. And this is why they're actually uh, a good tool. When we see ants trailing up something like our plum tree or our tomatoes or anything um, that is kind of a branchy plant, it's actually telling us that there's another insect in there like aphids because aphids and other soft-bodied insects secrete 
a sticky substance called honeydew and the ants are actually farming it and they're actually protecting the aphids from any uh, predator insects. So if we see ants trailing up plants, then we know we've got another problem like aphids. So we want to address the aphids and then the ants will go away. Darn. And if ants are in like a planting bed or a pot, it's typically, it's typically because we weren't um, really uh, watering that planter enough, or maybe it was just dry. Like sometimes I'll go to plant a new planter that didn't have anything in it for like, I don't know, a few weeks or a month. And then I'll, I'm like, I'll unbury like a bunch of ants. Typically they'll go away once you've like started to cultivate that, plant it, get some fertilizer in it and things like that. They typically go away. Okay. All right. So, oh, I like this next question. So Suzanne, imagine you're at the nursery or the hardware store, you know, getting a plant, you know, what are some things that you look for when you're selecting the plant that you want to bring home? Oh my gosh. What a great question. Well, I'm going to first read the tag. Okay. Cause I might go to the store just looking for one ingredient like fertilizer. And I always have to go cruise the plants. Right. And I don't need any more tomatoes or I don't need any more cucumbers, but there might be something I just can't live without. So I'm going to cruise the aisles and I'm going to look at the tags and see if it's something interesting. I'm always interested in heirlooms, especially new varieties that I'm not aware of. And I'll read the tag just out of curiosity, just to see, Oh, that's interesting. Um, I just like to learn about plants and see what's out there. And then I'll see uh, the reason, well, this six pack of lettuces that I bought the other day where I've already planted two cells, it was the last of this variety. So I bought it. I wasn't, you know, really very critical of it. Um, and, but then what I'm going to look for is, I kind of want to look for the stems the stems look healthy, the leaves look healthy. Um, I don't even mind if there's like a broken piece. I don't care about that because I know there's gonna be things that grow, but I wanna make sure are the root systems, do they look healthy? Um, you know, you can gently take a cell pack out of the cell or four inch out of its pot and look at it. You wanna be extremely gentle though. You don't wanna break the plant. Um, and I just kind of like, kind of see like how many um, branchlets there are, um, just kind of see what the structure is, or is it a plant where I only want one stem? Kind of depends. And then really looking at the color and the health. Sometimes I'm gonna buy a plant that maybe um, just arrived as opposed to a plant that I know has been sitting in the garden center for a while, because um, the ones that have been sitting in the garden center for a while sometimes can be a little bit more stressed. Now that's not a problem, but I know to look for um, any insect infestations because sometimes plants that I've brought home from the garden center when they're stressed because they've been in that little pot for so long without getting fertilizer, they might be prone to getting some aphids. Then if that happens, I just notice and I wash those aphids off and then the plant is going to regain its health and adjust to its new gardening space and grow just fine. Great. Yeah, great tips. All right. Um, so for a question regarding tomatoes, where can you buy that large square or rectangle frame that you were talking about? Oh, wow. I, everywhere I go, I do work with a lot of garden centers. So I do have an advantage, even hardware stores. I love those square ones because they fold down flat. Um, I can't remember where I got those because I have a lot of different types, but I would check out, um, I would go to Golden Nursery. I would go to um, Hassett's Hardware. You can even try, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's. Uh, and then just see what they have in stock. Sometimes this late in the year, their inventory is lower, you know, a little smaller, but, um, they start coming in. March is a really good time of year to buy tomato support, but they're around. They're common. They're way more common than they used to be. But I do like the ones that fold down. They're much easier to store. Great. 
Yeah, and uh, for those of you that don't know, Golden Nursery is located right in San Mateo off of 101. So that's, you know, pretty easy to get to yeah. if you're in the area. They're a wonderful nursery, really, really uh, knowledgeable staff. They're amazing. All right, um, and next question, my lettuce leaves are turning brown. So do you think that it could be that, um, that they're not getting enough water or would that be too much water? Well, you'd have to check the soil. Now, if they're turning brown, I'd like to ask how mature is the lettuce? Uh, what parts of the leaves, is it the older leaves that are turning brown? Is it the newer leaves, is it just the tips? Older leaves are gonna turn brown, that's normal, okay? Uh, newer leaves coming up, um, what should look fine. If um, all of the leaves have a little bit of browning, it could be from wilt that they didn't get, you know, that they got watered a little bit past the threshold and they weren't able to recover. It could also be a little bit of wind damage. It could also be a little bit of frost damage. Um, it kind of depends. You want to, that these are things when we're in our gardens paying attention to the weather and the wind. Uh, when I have windy afternoons, I start to be a little bit on high alert and I'll go check some of my tender uh, little starts, especially the lettuces, because they're so, uh, the leaves are so fragile. And I'll start to see, do they need a little bit of wind support? You know, like a little bit of a, 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 a barrier to prevent them, to protect them from wind. But I can't tell you if it was overwatering or underwatering because the symptoms of overwatering and underwatering are almost identical. You want to feel the soil. And I had a tendency to overwater just a few weeks ago because we were having heat. And then all of a sudden I noticed um, that some white flies on one of my plants. And even though the white flies love dry conditions, they're typically uh, attracted to plants that are overwatered. So it's just an indicator. When you see pests out there, they sometimes give me a little bit of a, a clue to look at, oh, what's going on? Is, is the irrigation broken? Is the irrigation going on too much? Not enough. Is there uh, too much soil around the crown of that plant? Is there something else going on? So the pests are sometimes really good because they tell you that something else is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Not always, but... <laughs> Uh, and speaking of white flies, so one participant's asking, or um, asking, you know, I've been spraying tiny white flies off of my tomato plant with a spray bottle. Um, are some flies okay? Okay, so that's great that you're just using a spray bottle of water for white flies. Um, just wash them off. I, if the leaves are really infected, like if I've got an infestation of white flies on a leaf, I'll just cut that leaf off. Um, some flies. Uh, if they're not white flies, we see a lot of uh, little small flying insects in the garden. They could look uh, very, very tiny. Maybe they're as small as fungus gnats. Those could be uh, um, beneficial um, parasitic wasps, or also flower flies, anything that's in the hoverfly or surfid fly family. Those also can be very, very tiny, minuscule, all the way to about a half an inch in size. So there's a lot of insects that are flying around our gardens that are beneficial. And they're also pollinating our plants and taking care of our pests. But white flies, I would say, is typically an indicator of overwatering. So first, make sure you're not overwatering. Also, be really careful if you're using synthetic fertilizers. I'm not here to shame anyone, but just know that synthetic fertilizers, those are the things that turn uh, green or blue when you add water to them, or they're little multicolored pellets that we add to the soil. Mm -hmm. They're going to um, have a tendency to make our plants more prone to pest problems. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is as we're moving into a drought, those fertilizers are very high in salts and they have a tendency to um, build up. That salt has a tendency to build up on the top inch or two of the soil. And um, that's going to be really um, challenging or really detrimental to our plants as drought comes on. Great. All right. So just um, I think maybe one more question I'm coming up on 1130. Uh, ooh, what are your thoughts about Roundup? I'm sure I could probably guess, but go ahead. Um, okay, well, Roundup is uh, an herbicide. The active ingredient is glyphosate, and um, Roundup is not the only 
way to buy glyphosate. Glyphosate is, you can purchase uh, as um, an ACE brand. Um, I know you can buy it through uh, Bonide and I think Monterey Lawn Garden has it. Just about any, any of the companies that make herbicides are manufacturing uh, glyphosate. So it's not just Roundup for one, but, um, and Roundup isn't the only herbicide that I think is a problem for my garden. Understand when we apply Roundup to the soil, we're killing the plant, but we're also um, impacting any ground nesting bees. 70% uh, uh, of our native bees are ground dwellers. We're also impacting any uh, earthworms and any other vital living organisms in the soil. And that's really my priority. Uh, healthy soil is the priority in my garden and as it should be in your garden. Because when we have healthy soil, we have healthy plants. And then from there, we are less likely to have pest problems. But weeds are gonna pop up. Um, I know it's not always easy to pull weeds. I have to be honest, this year is the first year that I started to get a little lower back pain from pulling weeds. And I've been doing this for a very long time professionally. So I understand when you get a little older, it's not always so easy, but there's other things we can use. We can use stand up. Um, there are there are tools that you can pull weeds by standing up. They're very interesting. Uh, you can also mow weeds. You can cut them with a the line trimmer. You can even cut them with scissors. You can use sheet mulch. Um, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of other ways you can actually kill the weeds or get rid of them. Um, but there's also eco-friendly herbicides on the market and, um, and they're going to, uh, right now, Ortho makes one, it's called Ground Clear. It's not the complete Ground Clear, but it's um, an active ingredient that is going to work really well as a top kill. So uh, what I'd really invite you to do is to look at the active ingredient of any pesticide you buy. And the pesticides can be an insecticide or an herbicide or a rodenticide or whatever it is that you're trying to kill. Just go ahead and do a little research and find out what the uh, active ingredient um, is, how, um, what the mode of action is, how it's intended to work and kill the pest you're trying to kill or the weed you're trying to kill. And then also understand what's the toxicity level and not just to you or pollinators and bees, but also to our groundwater, our waterways. Uh, all those synthetic fertilizers and pesticides end up in our um, storm drains, which uh, goes right out to the bay. Or if we're using these pesticides inside the house, they end up through our, our sinks, you know, the because um, we're cleaning up and those pesticide residuals are staying on the sponge or they're getting in the rag and they're going through the laundry or anything like that. Pesticides and other chemicals are not removed at the treatment facility. Um, sadly, the treatment facilities are not um, sophisticated enough. So just know everything ends up in the water. And um, I'm a huge advocate also for clean water. Uh, so that's another reason why um, to answer your question, how do I feel about glyphosate or Roundup? I don't have any opinion necessarily about Roundup or glyphosate. I have an opinion about all chemicals that um, we need to be really careful and really understand how to use them. Uh, when we're using them properly, uh, we can um, have a less uh, negative impact. Mm -hmm. And we wanna also understand the unintended consequences consequences of all of our actions because even eco-friendly products can impair beneficial insects if we're not using them properly. So there's a long answer yeah. question. Yeah. And then um, I know we did get a comment about someone saying that they don't like when all insects are called pests and I completely agree. And actually Suzanne taught a fantastic class last year on attracting beneficial bugs to your garden. Um, and yes, um, yeah, that's a fun yeah. one. I've been teaching it a lot lately as well. And um, I believe, well, I think Charlotte, our other IPM advocate just taught one for Flows to the Bay. Mm -hmm. And you still have your opportunity to catch one more. It's uh, June 6th, wait, June 3rd, Thursday. This Thursday coming up, I'm teaching it at 4 p.m. Um, you can find out on my website, plantharmony.org. It's my last 
beneficial insect gardening for the good bugs program for the uh, season. So if you're interested, join us, you can register on my website and it's that one's hosted by um, Alameda County clean water uh, program. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Great. And with that, we are at time. We are just a few minutes over, but I'd like to thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I know it's Memorial Day weekend, so I'm really excited that, you know, there were at least 30 participants that uh, yes, decided to you. join us on this busy weekend. Yeah, um, I am so happy. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to go outside and plant my lettuces. I'm going to get in the garden and make a yummy salad for lunch. I'm so excited. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for your great questions. I really appreciate everyone this morning. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate being able to teach this class. Yeah, you're welcome. And I will send a follow-up email to everyone who registered so you can get a copy of the recording. It'll probably take a week. Um, and I'll also put in um, some more information on that class Suzanne just mentioned. Okay, that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, everyone. thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Have a great weekend. You too.